Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Mind Pump. In this episode, we speak to our good friend Jason Phillips about how to lose fat, perform better, and live forever. Is that even possible to do all those three things, or do they conflict with each other? You're going to find out in this episode. Jason, welcome back. Dude, good to be there. Welcome. Is this what is this your four? Is this your fourth time now on our I show? I believe this is round four. Yeah, we appreciate you coming on the show. You're, I think that's um, going to be the it. award for the I most. I was going to uh, say that's got to be close to the record. Maybe who else would have mm-hmm. been on longer? Max more? is up there. Max Lugavere. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we've had quite a few times. Uh, I think that's it. We like Max though. Max is awesome. Max is the man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We were just talking about him. He's yeah, really solid. Guy. Really nice guy. But we like you because you really do a good job of talking to um, you know some of our most important. Uh, listeners, which are coaches and trainers and people who are helping other people. No doubt. In fact, uh, so yesterday we're kind of you know, on this text thread and talking about, well, what do you want to talk about uh, on today's episode? And you said um, basically why you can't lose fat, improve your performance and live forever. Correct. So what do you mean by that? What yeah, it's actually, that? it's the foundation um, that we that we build our cert on, right? And it's really the foundation of when I went into the CrossFit space, it's what nobody wanted to hear. Um, you know, I, I kind of stumbled on it on accident in the sense that when I did CrossFit, I was still eating like a bodybuilder and I'm like, well, surely I can look like a high level CrossFitter, you know, ripped and whatever and perform really well. And naturally I'm going to be healthy. So why won't I live longer? Except what happened was my performance tanked. I felt like shit. I started looking like shit. And if I kept feeling like that for a very long time, there's no chance I would be living to, you know, 90 plus or into Mm -hmm. my hundreds. And so I started investigating it and I started just literally thinking about everything I learned in school and everything I understand in the industry at a high level and really went back to the foundation. And I was like, all right, to, to lose weight or to look good, which is typically perceived as fat loss, right? Fat loss and muscle gain. Uh, to lose fat, we have to be in a calorie deficit. We have to eat adequate protein ratio of carbs to fats independent on the individual. Um, okay. So calorie deficit being the big driver there. Well, to perform better, very rarely are we going to recommend a calorie deficit, (laughs) right? I mean, we might make the exception that if you have a low training age, or if we're really trying to put you in an advantageous hormonal position temporarily, we could talk about it, but that's the exception. That's not the rule. The rule would be adequate calorie intake and, or, uh, you know, perhaps maybe a surplus Mm -hmm. and then to live forever, mild calorie deficit, but heavy emphasis on micronutrients, absence of carbohydrates, which we know is going to fuel, uh, performance. And it doesn't really matter if you have a six pack because to get to really low levels of body fat is highly stressful in the body. Mm -hmm. Stress being the antithesis of longevity. And I was like, man, all three of these things are completely different, except the average person in this world is trying to yeah, achieve all of them, all of them at the <laughs> same at time. Once. And here's the fucked up part. As an industry, we're kind of promoting that yeah. you can. Yeah. And mm-hmm. I was like, so I always say in 2012, I was the most hated nutrition coach in CrossFit. And then in 2013, I was the most loved because I took the methods and I proved them to be true. And I was like, listen, if we stop chasing aesthetics in the heart of performance, you will perform better. And so the next year I had several people on the podium at the games. Then I said, cool, in the off season, we can get you to wherever you want aesthetically, assuming it it aligns with what you need to be better the following year. My athletes look great in the off season. Well, we didn't really discuss longevity with CrossFitters because I don't think anybody high level CrossFitting is going to live forever. I just think that training three and four times a day in that modality is probably not advantageous to living forever. But the studies are pretty clear on what is going to create lots of longevity. And, you know, guys like we were talking about Max and, you know, Ben and those guys that really understand the biohacking world, but more so the longevity world, they will tell you neither of those things matter. Yeah. It's funny because uh, this is when people get really shocked when they hear about like, um, you know, Olympic athlete, so-and-so or world world record marathon runner or fitness enthusiast, you know, influencer, you know, dies of a heart attack or gets sick. And everybody's like, Oh my God, how's this possible? this person is like the best athlete in the world at their sport. And it's like, you know, the work that when it comes to longevity, super extreme athletes have terrible longevity. Yeah, You're sacrificing longevity for extreme um, athletic pursuits, which is crazy considering we tend to take our longevity advice from those very people. Where do you guys think the origin of, of that narrative is. Well, it's interesting, you know, when we look at the fitness industry as a whole, what what typically promotes fitness is a body 
at low levels of body fat. Mm -hmm. yep. And you know, that person then talks about how they achieved it and how it's the quote unquote picture of health, except all of us in here have dieted to very low levels of body fat. We all understand how we felt, how we performed at those times. I mean, you did a show yeah. when you turned pro, how did you feel? Like yeah, looking back, the things that you did to get there, do you think those are the picture? Of no, I mean, there's a, there's a reason why they call bodybuilders walking dead men. Right. I mean, cause you, you're right on the borderline of that when you get up on that stage. So yeah, I mean, we were just talking about the evolution of it and the limits that are literally going to be pushed. I mean, we were making a joke that, you know, Arnold back in the day, Mr. Olympia, he wouldn't even qualify to be <laughs> a pro. Yeah. I don't know if he'd qualify to be a pro in men's physique, let alone classic physique. He wouldn't win Mr. San Jose. Absolutely not. Today. No, his conditioning would have to be better. His size would have to get bigger. Uh -huh. it, it just, it wouldn't work. And that's because the extremes of the drug use. And Arnold's been open that he used drugs. And clearly we're just willing to push different limits with different drugs now. But also, I mean, at that time, think back to it when you were a pro, you weren't bragging about your lifts. You know, if, if social media was like monstrous at then, like you're not posting videos of yourself back squatting 500 pounds, deadlifting 600 pounds yeah, or, or anything out. like that. No, <laughs> if anything, you're trying to make sure you don't get hurt. Right. And so we look at, you know, th then everyone's going to listen to this. And they're going to be like, yeah, but like, what about the wide receiver in the NFL that's super ripped? Great. He sprints a lot. And I promise you when he's going to practice, he's not looking in the mirror at how ripped his abs are. He is paid for one thing, and that's to catch a lot of balls, to get in the end zone, to score touchdowns. Like, that's it. Nobody not only, gives a fuck how they look. Not only that, but like, you know, like DJ Metcalf represents 1% Amen. of the population. No, like less than that. It's like 1% of the 1%. You're yeah, right. Of, yeah, he's 1% yeah, of the 1%ers, right? So he's just, he's a he's not, and we love to do that, right? We like to to extrapolate that one example and be like, look, you know, well, I th I that's think right, where I was getting with that with you guys. I wanted, I, cause my theory is that it really was when the supplement industry and nutrition mm -hmm. really made its way into like, uh, athletics into sports, because then we started to highlight these super athletes and pair them with a protein powder or pair them with a, a, a food that they ate. And it even is, I mean, if you go back far enough, I think actually companies that weren't even health companies figured it out first. I think the McDonald's and yeah, the fast food places started pairing themselves with the Michael Jordans, oh, the Charles chocolate Barclays. milk had a heyday there. For yeah, no, I, so athletics. I, you know, so I, is that how this got imprinted on, on, society's mind of like they they see they saw you know michael jordan sitting down mm -hmm. and having a, a a big mac and so therefore and he looks really lean and ripped so therefore i can eat that or should eat that too i at, mean at the end of the day everything's marketing right like when when milk sales are down what do you see on the tv you see commercials and it reminds you that milk has vitamin d and it has mm -hmm. calcium and it's like it, it promotes that it's going to cure cancer or, you know whatever right it's whenever something needs to be promoted to sell something, they'll say virtually anything or they will try to create inferences that they don't openly state, but they make it out to be true. Yeah. Right? Well, there's also this, and that is that there's the most effective lies are ones that have a little bit of truth in them Yep. because they'll take a little bit of truth and then they push it and turn it into a, a big fat lie. So is there truth that if you took the average deconditioned unhealthy person who eats a standard American diet, if you change things to improve their health, will they lose fat? Will they perform better? And will they live longer? Yes, they will do all of those things. But at some point you start to do the trade-off and it's not the extremes. It's definitely not the extremes. Extreme, any of those that I just said means you're taking away from the others. For example, the people that live the longest don't have the best extreme performance and they definitely didn't walk around at 3% body fat, right. right? And the extreme, you know, fat loss experts didn't perform their best for sure. And it's, it, you also need to compare yourself to yourself. So yes, you could find someone at 4% body fat who's going to outperform me uh, at a higher body fat percent, but look at their performance versus their performance. Them at 4% isn't going to perform as well as them at 11%, for I example. Think, I think what we're talking about in essence, and I love what you just said is relative versus absolute. Yeah. Right. And I think that the, the illustration I would always use to show this is a triangle. And so we understand that if we start in the center, we can navigate towards any of the points. And that navigation towards one point is also a subsequent navigation away from other points. Does that mean that you aren't still close to those points? No, but mm -hmm. the further you go towards any specific point, you are becoming a maximal distance away from other points. So the more we go towards extreme aesthetics, let's just say like Mr. Olympia, the more we go towards that extreme, 
we are moving further and further away from the other points. So yes. we're getting further and further away from our ability to perform. We're getting further and further away from our ability to live forever. The same would be true for performance. The, the more we try to win the CrossFit games, the less that we are eating to look our best, not saying by proxy that we don't look better. In some cases you might because yeah. of the training volume and the caloric expenditure, but we are also moving away from our affinity to live forever. And that's what people have to understand is it's a game of absolutes or relatives mm -hmm. and which one are you navigating? And I love the point that, you know, in the beginning, this conversation probably doesn't hold any weight yeah. because sometimes you're getting results in spite of what you're doing, not because of what you're doing, right? Yeah. Like when I was anorexic, if I started to eat to look better, that would have been muscle gain. Well, if I start to go into a calorie, you know, just like a, a you know, maintenance mode, if I got to maintenance, that was more calories than I was eating. By proxy, I'm probably going to perform better. And because I'm finally giving myself enough micronutrients, yeah. I'm probably going to be in a better health yeah. status. Does that mean that I went to the extremes? No, but there was some slight improvement yeah. relatively speaking. And we need to be careful when we also, I want to go back to, you know, you use the example of a professional athlete. I forgot his name, uh, but you want to be careful looking at these anomalies. And they're anomalies because they don't represent not even close to the average person. It's, it's like looking at Michael Phelps and saying, wow, if I swim, um, I'm going to have the leg length of someone that's 5'9 and arm length of someone that's six foot seven, right? Because that's Michael right. Phelps' body proportions. His ape index is insane. Right. But that's not, that's, that's not what happened. What happened was he was born that way, and then he took up swimming, and then he's also a hard worker and all that stuff. So you can't look at these anomalies and say, well, that's, that's how I'm going to look if I train that particular way. Well, that person probably going to look like that. Or they're going to probably look better than you doing almost anything because they win the genetic lottery yeah. in that particular um, uh, situation. So the extremes take away from the others is what you're saying. I, I completely agree. And the other thing that we want to throw in here, because I know some people listening are like, but I love to train this particular way. I love to eat this particular way. There's also quality of life that I think we need to factor in. Yeah. Like if I told you, you would live 10 years longer than your normal expected life expectancy. However, in those last 10 years, you're going to be hooked up to machines and bedridden, right? Do, would you like that trade? Most people say no. That's zero quality of life. And right. I'm using extreme to illustrate what I'm about to say, but that is that quality of life is also something real important. So you could chase some of these things, but if you compromise quality, like for me, like for example, it's probably not smart to train super heavy anymore at this point. I mean, right. I'm 43, I've been working out forever. But there's a certain value that I find in it that has nothing to do with my body, has nothing to do, definitely not with my joints because it hurts me, <laughs> but I do it because it, it increases my quality of life. And so there's that as well that I want to make sure we throw in there. Yeah. You know, I think that as, as we get deeper into the discussion, there's two types of people that, that are listening, right? There's, there's probably people that like health and fitness and are just listening to this for advice for themselves. And then of course there's the trainers and coaches. And, you know, if you're an individual that's just into health and fitness, you have to understand, okay, well, I want to lose fat today. How many times when you guys were trainers, when, you know, if you really got somebody to commit 12 weeks, 14 weeks, 16 weeks, 20 weeks, whatever it is, the further they get into the diet, we understand performance is going to be compromised. And we also understand, you know, at least biofeedback markers, maybe not overall health status, but biofeedback markers are also going to be compromised. And so we hear from them at the eight week mark or the 10 week mark, man, like, I'm just not as strong, man. I don't, I don't have as much energy. My, my sex drive is going down. My sleep isn't mm -hmm. as good. And I think that individuals, if you're pursuing fat loss at a high level, I think you have to be self-aware enough to understand you can't have it all in that moment. It's a trade. There is. And then as the coach, I really think that this understanding should be the foundation that you use when starting with your clients. Yes. I had a strong belief that, and I would actually draw a picture of a triangle for clients. And I would say, where in this triangle are your goals? And they would draw their, they draw a circle inside the triangle. And I would say, cool. Now articulate to me what that means. And they'd say, well, you know, I want to lose some fat and I want to, I want to perform better, but I really want to feel good. And I'm mm -hmm. like, okay, can I tell you what I see? Mm -hmm. And they're like, sure. And I'm like, well, what I see is, you care most about losing fat, which means maybe in the journey, you might get a little weaker. And at times you're okay with feeling less than optimal. Are we on the same page? And they're like, no, hmm. I don't, I don't want to get weaker. What a great way to present that, by the way, for all the coaches that are listening. I think that's such a powerful way to illustrate. Yeah. Cause people don't, 
you're setting proper, honest, truthful expectations. Yes. yes. And, well, they, you, and, and they don't know how to communicate that yet. Like, how, does any relationship that ends well start without proper expectations? No. <laughs> right. Never. And so why should fitness be any different? Mm. And so for us, this is the setting of the expectations. This is foundational understanding of the journey that we're going on together. Do you teach all the coaches to teach that right this there? This is literally the foundation that we built our level. Oh, I love on. that. And because again, when we, I, when this we is so MCI, important. I, I need to illustrate this. What you're saying right now is so important to the coaches listening right now. This is a huge factor, huge. whether or not you're going to be achieve long-term success with a client or not. And if you do this right, you will also attain, uh, attain greater financial success Bingo. as a result of it. So I just want to emphasize that because I hope people understand. This could be one of the biggest determinants of your client success, mm -hmm. which is the biggest determinant of your business success, right? I know we've had conversations around the entrepreneurial side of the business, which you certainly have to have understanding of. Even that is second in nature to creating client results. Because mm -hmm. you can be the best marketer, the best salesperson. If you don't deliver on your promises, at some point, you're the biggest fraud. That's right. It. Right. And so you have to be able to create client results. And client results come from an understanding of the journey. Because if I'm starting you on a path to lose 100 pounds, in my head, I'm like, yeah, you're, you're going to get a little weaker. Right. Unless your training age is nothing. But, you know, if you're if you're trained and you're conditioned, you're going to get a little weaker and you're not going to feel the best all the time. That's OK. And so. But if I don't articulate that to you and you have different expectations, we're playing two completely different games. And so when you come to me and you're pissed off that you're weaker and that you feel bad and I'm like, well, no shit. Well, now all of a sudden us being on different pages mm -hmm. causes massive strain on the relationship. And so this this literally becomes the start point. But that brings up a whole nother question, right? Which is, well, what if my client does want it all? And well, you know, you're a coach. It's your job. To right. It is. And I, and I actually think that there's, I, I always live by the quote, you can have it all. You just can't have it all at the same time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that really good coaches, and by the way, this goes into building your business, really good coaches help clients understand that you just have to periodize the seasons of your results. Yeah. Because I think all of us in here at some point in our careers have chased aesthetics. We've chased performance and we've chased longevity. Mm -hmm. None of us in here, because of the understanding that we have, have chased them all concurrently. And so the real question becomes is how do we start to do that? And I think there's great answers to that yeah, as well. There's two things I want to mm -hmm. add to this. One is if you're a coach listening and, you know, you kind of breeze through this, you said you create seasons. Mm -hmm. That also presents to you as a coach a wonderful planning and even mm -hmm. sales opportunity. Bingo. And so now, you, by the way, as trainers, when I say sales, don't shut your ears. I, I'm talking about <laughs> You're painting uh, a producing, vision. producing results for your clients. Part of producing results for your clients is you have to, because they don't know, they're, they're hiring you for a reason. They really don't know what it's going to look like. And if I can show them specifically season one aesthetic, season two, I'm going to break it down very basic, season one aesthetic, season two performance, season three, and then we're going to focus on longevity. Now they see the plan. Mm -hmm. And oh, by the way, each season is six weeks long, 10 weeks long, whatever, that also works very well for me as a coach with my business. Because now instead of saying, hey, you're going to work with me for 30 weeks, well, what does that mean? Now they're like, oh, I see exactly what that all looks like. So that's number one. Number two, I understand what happens with trainers, especially new trainers and new coaches, is they want to promise everything to the person because they think it's going to get, it's going to make them more likely to hire them or yep. more excited. The truth is, and I remember learning this as a new trainer, when I was dead honest with a client they say, Oh, I want to lose 30 pounds. When do you want to do it by? I want to lose it in 60 days. And I'd say, that's probably not going to happen in 60 days. When I was honest with people, I lost zero clients. Yep. In fact, what happened is I got more clients because I was being honest and truthful with them. It wasn't like they said to me, Oh, I can't do this in 60 days. I'm out of here. They said, well, why can't I? And what's going on? And then they were very grateful that we had a very honest discussion. I always painted realistic expectations. And then what I tried to do is set myself up to have them exceed the things that I talked about. Yep. So I said, look, you're probably only going to lose three pounds in the first 60 days because we're doing this, this, and this. And then they lose six pounds. They're like, holy cow, this is amazing. Yep. But if I told them I was going to lose 20 pounds, well, now they're disappointed. Yeah. And then you also have to start using tactics that you're not on board with. And right, it, that becomes a whole other ethical dilemma. I mean, at the end of the day, I think we can all agree from the business side, the truth is the best salesperson. Yes. Right. And every, every coach and trainer should understand that. By the way, that all of a sudden brings down the stigma of sales. Because oh, like yeah. you said, right, I'm going to say sales, all of a sudden coaches and trainers, they cover their ears, Always, they freak yeah. the fuck out. And it's like, listen, we're not talking sales, we're talking truth. And by the way, if you looked at sales as education of the truth, you would probably make more sales, yeah. <laughs> which is completely ironic in and of itself. All right, here's today's giveaway, MAPS Anabolic, the program that started it all. Here's how you can enter to win free access 
Leave a comment below this video in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Subscribe to this channel and turn on notifications. Do all those things. If we like your comment and pick you as the winner, we'll notify you in the comment section and you'll get free access to MAPS Anabolic. We also have a sale going on this month. MAPS OCR is 50% off and MAPS Cardio is 50% off. So they're both half off. If you're interested, click on the link at the top of the description below to get yourself set up. All right, here comes the show. I like what you said, though, about the different seasons. And, you know, like I said, this this whole notion is really the foundation of NCI. The follow up to that is, well, how do we help somebody do all of them? Because I think that let's take aesthetics and let's take getting on a bodybuilding stage as an example. We know when you went on stage, when you came off stage, you could not immediately go into the pursuit of performance or longevity. Yeah, of course not. Right. There's a season that is recovery, mm -hmm. right? There's a time where you need to, if you use drugs, you need to recover from the, the drug abuse, right? Mm -hmm. There's a time that if you didn't use drugs, you need to let, you know, you need to reverse diet or recover diet and get back to maintenance mm -hmm. so that we can recover the hormone, you know, decrements that happen. Um, we can feel better. We can enjoy life a little bit. At that point, we need to understand like, what is the internal machinery that we have and, and what is, what are we actually able to create either in the performance continuum or in the longevity continuum is, was our gut health compromised? Was, um, you know, are we strong? Are we, are we metabolically, uh, you know, have we created enough, um, what's the word I'm looking for, right? Uh, increasing like your metabolic capacity. Right. Have we done that enough to actually be able to put on weight or to gain enough strength or perform at a high level? And so I started looking at athletes and I was like, well, how do they get better every year, right? Using the DK Metcalf example. How does DK get stronger? How does he get faster? How does he get better at running routes? How does he become an overall better player? Well, he doesn't play football all year. So he doesn't do his sport all year, right? He recovers from the season. And he also has an off season where he tries to get stronger. He tries to acquire more skills. And then there's a period of time that he bridges that to playing the game. And I was like, well, if he's doing that, why isn't every human doing that in the pursuit of their goals? And so what we said is we're like, well, cool, there's three distinct sets of goals. There's aesthetics, there's performance, there's longevity. But if we periodize those goals, now all of a sudden you can start to stack them and we can chase multiple things. So if we chase aesthetics, we understand calorie deficit to the extreme, significantly low levels of body fat. That's what we would call season or the active pursuit of goals. Immediately after that, everybody understands there needs to be a postseason or a recovery season. We, you know, we quantify that as can we get back to normal homeostasis, right? A homeostatic balance defines a normal person. Cool. Well, then there's an off season. What are we doing to improve our chances of achieving our next goal? Whether that's another aesthetic goal, whether that's another performance related goal or longevity related goal. And then there's like a preseason, which is, am I setting myself up to achieve this goal maximally? So if it's performance, are we doing sports specific work? If it's aesthetics, am I prepared for the rigors of the diet? Have I set my social life up accordingly? Have I had the conversations with my significant other? Um, or if it's like longevity, it's, you know, have I truly created the foundation? Do I understand what foods work for me? Have I done the necessary testing to ensure that the journey I'm going on is going to work with me? but every single goal has a periodization, right? And so Sal, you laid out like what I would consider the macro periodizations, the, the performances, the uh, aesthetics, like mm -hmm. the longevity. And inside of those, there's micro periodizations. Oh yeah. Again, as a coach, if you're breaking this down to your client, not only are you getting them on board to the long haul, you're sharing with them the reasons that nothing else has worked. Because they've gone from season, like in season to in season to in season, which we know yep. every in season is a navigation away from set point, right? Calorie deficit is further and further away. There's adaptations that are happening internally. And the more and more we become adapted, we know we can't create future adaptation, which is why nobody's seeing results. Yeah. Now, when, when somebody is wanting all three of these, is there a natural flow for you that or that you would take them through this mm. journey? Meaning like when I'm hearing you go and I'm thinking about to my process of like competing and then let's say uh, I also in my triangle, I wanted performance, but yep. you, and you stated it perfect. I was like, obviously getting right off stage, going into plyometric work and training like an athlete would be, you're going to get hurt. Yeah. It'd be a stupid idea. Yep. Right. It would be totally irresponsible. So what what comes to mind for me logically is almost like the pursuit of longevity or homeostasis or health first and then transitioning over into is there a common mm -hmm. like flow that you would say that you run yeah, it Yeah, I think that everybody can understand that you're going to operate most efficiently from a high foundational level of health. 
And so I think that if you have, you know, gut health issues, if you have hormonal issues, it stands to reason we should tackle or at least create a solid base of longevity for you. Does that mean that I think you should navigate towards the extreme of longevity where you're eating low carb, where you're, you know, sleeping in a fucking cave and you're taking long walks on the beach? Like, <laughs> yeah. no, I don't think that you need to do that. But do I think that elements of that, right? Do I think you should get quality sleep? Do I think you should work on gut, work on hormones, yeah. work on controlling your stress? Absolutely. From there, I would say, like, let's us, let's assess you, the individual. Most people, we understand this in America, are overweight or obese. And so losing fat will help the body function more efficiently, right? I think that we've seen studies for men, most bodies function efficiently in the 8 to 10% body fat range. So they're going to be able to perform better or live longer from a slightly lower body fat percentage, not saying again, we're going to the extremes. We don't need to diet you down to 6% or 4% like Mr. Olympia levels, but losing a little bit at that stage, then I think we would tackle performance. So that would kind of be my hierarchy. Yeah. It's very relative to the individual, their metabolic history, right? Their, their like long-term goals chronologically, how old are they uh, or biologically? Yeah. How, how much damage I did in the competing Correct. would dictate how long I'm pursuing that longevity goal, right? Say, let's say I did it. I, let's say I did take copious amounts of steroids. Let's say I fucked my gut health up. Let's say my stress was like crazy. Yeah. Obviously the period that we are focused on, you know, quote unquote longevity after that would probably be longer than somebody who actually did very good weight management didn't have to reduce their body fat percentage that much, did it naturally, didn't have any gut issues. So that transition would look obviously yeah, much like If you took me today, I'm 38 year old, primarily an entrepreneur, right? That's how I spend the most of my days. I go to the gym three times a week now, mostly Golfing. for maintenance. Yeah. And I golf a ton, yeah. but super high stress lifestyle. I, I was telling Katrina, I was home 18 hours in the month of July, literally wow. in my home state for wow. 18 hours. And so there's a significant amount of stress on me, but I also walk around it seven to 8% body fat, right? I'm naturally lean, formerly eating disordered. I'm mentally fucked. So I will never <laughs> like allow myself to gain a significant amount of body fat. It just is what it is. And I've learned to accept that. Yeah. So I will always function less than optimally. I'm okay with that. I've, I've made peace with that. Um, but if we were to look at me and we were to periodize, I would say we should focus on longevity. We should probably fix my gut. I currently have a stomach ulcer, right? We should solve that. Like my hormones are in check. I'm on TRT. I've been on since I was 19 and anorexic. Um, and we should, con we should get my sleep habits better. We should control my stress at that point. That foundational level of health will allow me to probably maximize the performance I'm trying to do, which is I'm trying to become more explosively strong. I'm trying to become more mobile. I'm trying to hit a golf ball further and more consistently so that I can make it at a high level and turn pro. Yeah, no, yeah. there's definitely, there's definitely crossovers, uh, in all of these, but I think the confusion comes from the examples that we get for like longevity and health are the extreme yep. like shredded, you know, bodies. It, now make no mistake, health does look good, right? So being relatively lean is usually a reflection of being somewhat healthier, at least healthier than if you were mm -hmm. obese. Having longevity means you probably look healthier as yep. well. And you're probably going to perform better than if you didn't have good longevity, but really it's about these extremes. And I like what you're saying about periodization, because if you're going to pursue all three of these in some way, shape or form, or let's just put it generally, if you're going to have a fitness and health lifestyle for the rest of your life, or if that's your goal, the body tends to adapt best when you give it a bit of a focus, but you don't stay on that focus for too long. For example, Correct. if my goal is maximal strength, I know at some point I'm going to start feeling up my joints. Yep. I know at some point my mobility is going to suffer. I'm going to start losing, you know, mobility and maybe different planes of motion, especially if my max strength that I'm focusing on is on specific lifts, for example, right? If it's about performance and let's say for me, performance is how fast I can run a marathon. At some point, I'm going to start getting detrimental effects by pursuing that, right? Um, when it comes to longevity, which longevity is typically about moderation and balance and almost everything. I'm putting it loosely. Yep. But if I push that for too long, at some point, I'm going to maybe lose quality of life because that can be kind of boring. Be socially isolated. It's maybe socially isolated, like everybody's watching TV at night downstairs. And lose I'm up some muscle. In the dark, yeah. So- so there's Which these is not a great predictor of long-term right. health, right? Right. Or, or, nor is it good for aesthetics. Yeah. Right. So, so period of, you know, going into these seasons is great because a, your body adapts better that way. Yep. And they, and if you time it right, they actually feed into each other and B, and I think this is most important. We talk about this on the show all the time. It's the most fun. It's the most fun. If you plan on doing something for the rest of your life, you better find a way to make it well, enjoyable. Well, let's look at human behavior. 
the the hardest thing to do as a coach and as a trainer is get to somebody to stick to a plan long term. One hundred percent. And so I also love this notion because you can set very short term goals. Yes. Right. And if we start looking at the micro periodizations and the macros, we're not asking you to really make a commitment for a very long time. We're also setting very tangible end like end dates and very end goals. So you know, in the season, we're trying to get to a goal. Cool. Did we achieve the goal? Yes or no? People fucking love that. In the off season, hey man, we're recreation foundational level of health for men. You know, is your sex drive super high again? Awesome. Guys like that. You know, for the ladies, like, are you not moody all the time? Like they know that, mm -hmm. you know, in the off season, can we get you stronger? Can we get you eating more food? There's again, a tangible goal. And then when we start adding in sports specific or activity specific work, you start to feel really good because you're like, okay, I'm really ready to begin this pursuit again. And so you're taking the human psychological aspect, you're applying it and you're understanding people don't like monster long-term goals. I mean, you know, we were having an entrepreneurial conversation before this. If we're like, hey man, all of us are trying to lead, to achieve a hundred million dollars in net worth. That's a really big number. Mm -hmm. And if we set out every day and we're deploying against a hundred million, we're probably going to get bored at some point mm -hmm. because you got to make the first million. And so it's like, cool, let's make the first million. Let's figure out how to turn one to 10, 10 to 50, 50 to 80, 80 to 100. Right. And it's like those checkpoints are what keep it going. I don't know about you, dude, when you were doing cardio for for your <laughs> thing, like whenever I did cardio, I'd be like, just get to 10 minutes, just get to yeah. 10 and minutes. Then, and then, then, then at 10, I'm like, all right, get to 18, yeah. okay, 19. And like, and then I'm playing these like micro games. In well, I think I, I, my hack for, for cardio in the competitive world, I thought my big hack was I actually broke it into steps. Because so I, good, I thought our bouts of cardio was too crazy for me that yeah. I was just like, you know what I'll do is I'll look at my entire plan and go, oh, up until season time, right, for me competing, mm -hmm. I average 6,000 steps a day. Okay, so I'm going to start with walking 8,000, you know, consistently for a week. Okay, yeah. then 10,000. Like, And I actually didn't, I did not really do like our bouts on the cardio until like the final two weeks because I saw how torturous that was for people. Yeah, to just do small that. checkpoints though, that get you to that yeah. end goal. Jason, for you, um, cause you, you said something interesting about uh, how you'll never really let your body fat get past a certain point just cause of your own personal uh, struggles. How do you balance aesthetics with the other, with the other two performance? Yeah. And cause I have my own issues with certain things mm -hmm. and I have found that I have to balance it with the other stuff. Cause at some point the side effects of me pursuing the same thing all the time really starts to backfire. Yeah. What, what does that look like for you? How do you balance it out? Yeah, it's a really good question. I I understand. I don't I don't think longevity is ever something I'm going to be the best at. Um, <laughs> I have a little bit more of a proclivity towards it now that I have a daughter and she's getting older and you know, she's That'll attached do that. to me. Yeah, That'll man. I mean, that. having a four-year-old daughter is like, I want to live longer. So I, I do try to be better. Um, that being said, it's a mental battle every single day. I know that when I'm closer to nine or 10% body fat, I feel my best. I also know when I'm closer to 9% body fat, I look in the mirror and I hate myself. Mm -hmm. And there's, you know, that's just the mental shit from when I was 19 and being super open about it. Mm -hmm. um, you still struggle with that? I still do, man. Even at 9%, years old, really? 38 years old, bro. You're still critical of yourself like that? Wow. Like, I, I mean, super transparent. I looked in the mirror this morning and I'm like, man, like I got more more fat on my sides than I need to have. And like, dude, I'm fucking ripped right you now. You are ripped right now. Like, and, and it's like, <laughs> wow. like if somebody saw a picture, they'd be like, dude, you're dieting for something. And I'm not. Like, this is just how I walk around. And, you know, factually, we ate at STK last night and I went to the room and had two desserts. But I've also learned... How can I eat like that and maintain this? And so it's it's a really fucked game. up vicious you know the, cycle. You know what the difference is probably because I have uh, I've had body image issues myself. The difference now is probably you're aware of it. Yes. Whereas before, tons of denial, tons of denial, tons of denial. Yes. So yeah, there is an I, improvement. I'm way I want more people, open. Good. I want people to know right now. It's like, oh my god, I'll never get over this. Well, no, you you do through awareness. It's a process. I tell you know? everyone, it, you know, I mean, I, anorexia is anorexia nervosa, right? I I don't know to be you know, factually, is it a nervous system disorder? But I believe it is. Mm. And the fact that it's hardwired in your brain, I don't think ever changes. I think that you learn how to channel it a little bit better. And I'm okay with that. Like, so to answer the original question, though, I, I don't think longevity will ever be my thing. I also recognize now that if I wanted to be in a high level sport that requires super high athletic output, um, football, basketball, CrossFit, anything, I probably wouldn't be the best because I wouldn't be able to bring myself to eat enough. Mm. Fortunately, I happen to be really good at golf and that doesn't require as much output. <laughs> um, but I'll, I'll say, I mean, being on TRT and eating in a, you know, most of the time in a deficit has not been great for overall inflammation. Um, the fact that I'm overstressed and probably don't sleep enough because of my lifestyle and the entrepreneurial pursuits doesn't help focus. Um, and so 
my mobility suffers a little bit. My ability to concentrate at a high level suffers a little bit. And I'm aware of that when I'm on the golf course. And so there will come a day where I need to make a decision. The best line ever is we sponsor a kid named James Pyatt on the live tour right now. And we're out and I'm playing the pro-am with him in Chicago a couple of weeks ago. And he's talking about wanting to put on some size this off season and how he likes McDonald's and Burger King. And I was like, well, I'm like, we ain't trying to put on shitty size. And he looks at me and he goes, I don't fucking care. He goes, six packs don't win golf tournaments. <laughs> and I was like, you know what, man? Like great statement. But like, I, I don't know. I mean, you said you had body image issues. I could never make that statement Yeah. because yeah. I immediately I'm like, yeah, but who the fuck wants to not have a six pack? Like mm -hmm. that was the first statement I had in my head. And I'm like, man, like I, I wish I could have that, you know, so, like Bryson so, DeChambeau put on all that weight and he didn't put on great weight. And, you know, I was, I literally, I was just talking with Bryson and like two weeks ago and I'm actually getting ready to start working with him. And he is suffering effects from trying to pursue multiple sets of goals at the same time. Uh, and our whole conversation actually went back to what we're talking about today is he's like, Hey man, I just started whole 30 to fix my gut health. Cool. Hey man, I'm also really fucking tired all the time. Hey man, I don't sleep really well. And I'm like, well, you're on a, you're on a diet for longevity to fix gut health, right? Foundational issues. He's like, yeah. And like, I'm, I'm like losing way too much weight. Okay. Well, your aesthetics are suffering, right? Yeah. And I'm really tired all the time. Got it. Your performance is suffering. So you're eating for one goal, but you're telling me, you're asking me, how can I fix all three at the same time? And I kept reminding him the simple truth is we can't. And to go back to your question, Adam, you know, stacking those, I was like, let's address the foundational shit and accept the fact that you're not going to look the way you want to look right away. Yeah. And you're not going to jack performance through the roof right away. But once we've done that, let's attack performance while we're still in the golf season. Golf season ends another mm -hmm. two months for him. Then in the off season, let's worry about the body shit. So I want to, I want to stay here since you were vulnerable enough to, to admit that you still have a hard time with this. Cause I think there's a lot of people that can relate to this. Um, uh, when you, and knowing what you know, that you, you know, that you even, that I'm probably never going to be the longevity guy. Uh, but yet you recognize when there's things in your life that are suffering, sleep, stress, whatever these, what does it look like? Even though you've already accepted that I, you're, you know, you're not going to be the, you know, meditation guru walk guy, right. you know, what, what, what do you, what are things that you start doing in your life or what kind of changes when you, when those things start to like really rear its head on you and you go like, okay, I need to fucking, yeah. I know I've accepted, I'm not going to be that guy completely, but I need to adopt some of my own, my own philosophy here. What does that look like? When yeah, I think, um, I mean, I think it's pretty universal truth that the severity of pain dictates the speed of action. Mm -hmm. And so the more, the deeper I get into the rabbit hole, right? The further I get away from longevity, the faster I will take action on fixing those things. Um, I just don't think I implement permanent solutions. So like to give you an example, I mean, I'm, you do sitting. it enough to feel better. Exactly. And go back. Yep. I, I put a bandaid on it. It's, it's better. The bleeding stops, the wound heals a little bit. Right. But it's still susceptible to opening yeah. again. And so, you know, I'm sitting here today and I have a stomach ulcer from all the stress in my life. Have I gone out and like supplemented the way I know how? Nope. Have I 100% fixed my diet? Nope. You know what I do? I find like a diet seven up everywhere I go. And like, I make my stomach feel better most days. <laughs> right. I, I understand now I've been dealing with it for almost 45 days. So I am actively undertaking an, like an approach where I'm decreasing, you know, bacteria in my gut and then, uh, you know, aggressively overfeeding to kill it off. Yeah. Right. Or I'm killing it off and then I'm, I'm building new quality bacteria and they test you for H pylori. I'm assuming I haven't gone to the doctor for it. Like I it's self-diagnosed, but trust me, like all the symptoms it's yeah. there. Um, you and could have all H. pylori, stress, which would be easy fix by the way. Yeah. And, and I very well could, but again, the pain hasn't been high enough for me to go to a fucking <laughs> yeah. doctor and get tested. I also was home 18 hours for a month. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And that's just like where I'm at in my life. And, you know, so I, I also think that there's seasons of life yeah. too. You know, Steve and I were talking about this on the way here. Those people that don't know Steve's the VP of my company. And we were, we were talking about that on the way here this morning. And I was like, man, like, do you, do you ever just like look around and, and be like, man, like that person, they may not achieve some of the things we've achieved, but man, like look at what they're doing. And he's like, you'll get there one day. And I was like, I, I don't know if I will. And he's like, no, like we're just in a season right now. Yeah. And, and I think that there are seasons of life. And so right now I'm okay with this season being more about performance, right? In the business side. Yeah. Right? I, have a, I have a lot going on and uh, NCI is growing rapidly. Uh, we Exploding. need to hire more. Yeah, Every I mean, time I go, it's like twice as big. Every time I go speak at the event. Yeah, I mean, the, like, the next event you guys are coming to in April, literally double what last year was. Oh, we had a little wow. over 500 people. We're, we're slated to have a little over a thousand people next April. Wow. 
Um, it's That's awesome. It's it's amazing. It's a it's cool. It's a it's a rocket ship. You know, man. I do like want to say this. Off. I've said this before on the show. We've all said this in the show that that really good coaches and trainers always way better with their clients than they are with themselves. Mm. And, 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 Amen. And mm. I, th- this is true. And I think part of it is what makes you such part of what makes you a good coach and a good trainer. There's a lot of things, but part of it is understanding the challenge. Yes. Understanding the challenges that people mm. have, having empathy, being honest, being able to work with them. And it's much easier to understand those challenges when you yourself yeah. have to go through them and, and, and do them yourself. That, that being said, I wanted to ask you then in terms of like the coaching aspect of it and talking about these three different sort of directions mm-hmm. that potentially you're kind of presenting to your client, like how, how would you then articulate, um, you know, that psychological shift and like what to expect and like between each one of those yeah. different points? Yeah. I think you have to really define what the points are really quickly before I touch on that. I think that it's also Sal, to your point, um, I think that coach, the best coach and trainers have probably been through what they're asking their clients to do, which also makes me a very bad coach to coach longevity. Uh, <laughs> like, dead, like dead serious, yeah. right? Like rest in peace to my co-founder, Travis Zipper, right? You know, we lost him yeah. last year mm-hmm. and he was a phenomenal longevity coach. And ironically, like when him and I met, he was pursuing aesthetics and performance. Mm-hmm. I explained to him the triangle and he really bought in. He just shifted his whole life to longevity. Well, if you were one of his clients in his last two years on earth, he was the best in the world at that, which is, it's crazy, right? He pursued it himself. He mm-hmm. let it, it was, it was super dope. But um, Justin, to answer the question, I think that each season is defined by something, right? And so whenever I teach this, I ask people like, what is season, like in season, active pursuit of goals? Like, what is that defined by? And, and the reality is it's, it's defined by the end result, the performance. And so if we're trying to get you ready for a stage, it's designed, it's defined by what do you look like on stage? Our journey is not over till you hit the stage, till we peak correctly, until you feel like you hit your best, the end, right? And so you know that's what we're after. The, the next thing I'm going to give you when we're in postseason is I'm trying to get you back to a homeostatic balance. Now, I'm not going to make everybody get lab tests. If you're on steroids, I probably would. But for most people, we're going to use biofeedback. So it's a little bit subjective, um, but we have objective data if we've worked together for more than a year or you have previously objective data about things you were able to do, ways that you felt, et cetera. Right. Like we can look back at data. So we're trying to get all of those things together. The hardest one I would say is the off season, because, you know, I I tell people this is defined by strength and skill acquisition. And so how much strength can you acquire? How many skills can you acquire? How do you tangibly define that? We don't know what your upper limit is. We don't know what your ceiling is as a human being. Um, And so sometimes people are complacent, sometimes they're lazy, or you get very driven individuals. Uh, You know, I I look at uh, like a Saquon Barkley, um, who I think I just saw like a video of him squatting almost 700 pounds. And and in my head, I'm like, I know that wasn't the giant strength coach because in the NFL, like most strength strength coaches are glorified like injury preventers. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, this had to be an, an independent strength coach. But I'm like, this guy clearly has a high upper limit and he has a very strong proclivity towards performance in the off season. Amazing. He'd be a great person to coach. Then in the preseason, you're starting to compare yourself objectively to previous, like what metrics do you know, make you ready for, you know, the field or to diet, right? I think a lot of people have a hard time applying this concept to general population because they're like, well, what, aren't aren't we either dieting or not dieting? And I'm like, Mm -hmm. kind of, except every diet, we understand every calorie deficit is a navigation away from set point. And so if, you know, if we look at a unit away from set point and we go 10 units away from set point, well, it stands to reason that to be best suited for our next diet, we need to recoup those 10 units, if you will, right? So likely the duration of your diet will, you'll need at least that duration of your diet to recover. Um, sometimes it can be done faster, but very rarely. Uh, you know, the the research is kind of conflicting. We, we do understand we need to recover. There's some research that indicates speed of recovery. So if you increase calories more significantly early in the recovery diet, it will help. I, I don't know if I agree with that. The research, again, is not clear. Um, the off season is going to be based on your, you know, what your life is like. I don't think it's not a sport. So, you know, your season is not clearly defined. When is the next time you're actively going to want to pursue a goal? And then the preseason here would be, are you mentally prepared? I mean, dude, I don't know what it was like, you know, if you guys just diet for like random things now, but you got to mentally prepare for that. Your significant other has to know, listen, we're not having drinks every single night. We're not going to dinner three nights a week. We're, you know, uh, I might be a little more moody for the next six weeks. And then, you know, when we get to vacation, I'll be better, but you have to set those things up. It kind of goes back to the whole setting clear foundation. So Mm -hmm. I think that to best answer the question, it's about tangible outcomes. Yeah. You know, it's, you know, it's just to throw a wrench in all of this too, at some point, and this is just for the person listening right now, who's so, 
solely focused on one of those three components that we talked about. Mm-hmm. Because I know there's some people listening to like, well, cool, I don't care. I just want to be shredded or yeah. whatever. I don't give a shit. I just right. want to perform. Yeah, at some point, the extreme pursuit of just one, you're obviously compromising the other two, but at some yeah. point you'll lose the one you're after as well. Because well, at some an point, adaptation. right. Or just at some point, being extremely lean all the time and you're compromising your health, you're compromising. Return. Yeah. At some point your health goes so bad that be, you can't be lean well, like you could before. Every adaptation you create hinders your ability to, to adapt again in the same manner. Yeah. Right. And so more simply stated, every time we lose fat, it's harder to lose fat. Right. We know inherently like the body's, def- the body has the strongest, most sophisticated defense mechanism against body fat loss. Right. So as soon as you start losing fat, your body's like, fuck this. I, I need to mm-hmm. store fat. Right. Like I need to live. I'm I'm put on this earth to survive, thrive and procreate. So we know metabolic adaptations begin. And so the deeper we get into the fat loss journey, the harder it is to lose fat. Well, the more you improve your performance, like we're not put on this earth to run four second, 40 yards. Right. We're not put on this earth to squat 600 pounds. And so your body starts doing things. Why do people get injured at their highest levels of performance? Right. We look at uh, one of the things I used to always be able to tell whenever I saw a CrossFitter that was super lean and they were at a high level competition. I'm like, that person's going to get injured. And everyone's like, how did you, how did you predict that? And I'm like, they are literally at the peak of their output. And mm-hmm. the minute they go beyond threshold, their body is going to intentionally injure itself mm-hmm. to prevent Protection any future mode. output, right? Which it perceives as a threat to itself. Right. And so the, the more adaptation you create in a specific manner, the more difficult it becomes to continue adapting in that same manner which again speaks to the need to periodize. Now, do you have to rotate through the different ones? Absolutely not. NFL athletes are staying in performance for years at a time. People that compete in physique components, they're they're staying in the same uh, you know, the same point of the triangle uh, the same every single year, right? It's like, hey, I'm going to look a certain way. I'm going to recover. I'm going to do an off season. I'm going to get ready for my next show. Right. And it's, so they're, they're still saying in the same modality. Um, so you don't have to rotate through them, but you definitely do have to periodize. Yeah, yeah. I, would, I would make the case though too that those examples, you see the greatest uh, you know, repercussions from those people. The people that stayed in bodybuilding oh God, for yeah. decades end up with the most problems. That the people that played football for ten years yeah, that's end because up the compromises being made or just yeah, being yeah absolutely. In other so words, even though even though you could do it right and and well, be dude, we, we looked up a stat on on NFL before we started yeah. this right. The average NFL athlete that's dying is yeah. happening between fifty six and fifty nine years old. Yeah. Yeah. Not the average person that's dying that played football is sub sixty. I mean that's fucking scary. Yeah. And I have to assume that very few of them are like well. I'm going to play football for a year, but you know what? Next year I'm going to do bodybuilding. Yeah. Right. But then I'll go back to football the following year. Yeah, or, yeah. or maybe I'll go sleep in a cave for a year. Yeah. Like they, they don't do that. No. They continue hammering home. And and if I had to guess, they're probably not periodizing. Yeah. Right. And you know, then this creates a whole nother issue, especially at high level athletics is like, well, why don't athletes do this? If this knowledge is out there and it's readily out there, yeah. Why aren't people doing it? Yeah. And the reality is now we're talking sponsorship dollars. Mm-hmm. Now we're yeah. talking about self-identity. There's some issues. There's, the there's extremes. Well, um, if you guys are UFC fans, there's some UFC guys that are getting in the octagon that should not fucking be fighting. Like if uh, I don't know how the Diaz brothers still do it. They've been banging, and banging. Yeah. Well, shout out today. to Nate for winning his last. Fight. I mean, uh, that's what I'm that saying. I don't understand. But he, but he beat Tony Ferguson, who yeah. I that's actually who I was going to talk about. Tony looks so bad yeah. in that fight. And I'm a huge UFC guy. Yeah. Like I'm such a UFC fan. He looks so fucking bad in that fight. He has to understand his time is done. Yeah. Like, and he was, dude, he was great. He is one of the reasons the UFC got to where it yeah. is. I think that if had, if him and Khabib had fought their very first time when they were supposed to fight, it would have been an amazing fight. Like it, I'm a big UFC guy. His time is up yeah. and he finishes that fight. And he's like, guys, I'm just getting started. Oh, getting started what? Yeah. Like moving closer to your fucking coffin yeah. because that's it. Yeah. Like, you know what sucks is that attitude is what got him there. Yeah. yeah. Now, now, you and have now to, it's his detriment. It's now you got to drop early it. On, Crazy. Yeah. Now you got to drop that attitude. Yeah. It's funny. Arthur Brooks, good friend of ours, uh, wrote a book called from strength to strength. And yeah. he talks about how, and this is kind of along the lines of what we're talking about, how after retirement, there's this diverging graph where some people, do great, improve quality of life, live longer. And some people's health just immediately suffers. They have a really uh, terrible quality of life. And he said, the difference between the two are that people can shift the people that can shift. So the people that are doers and then they retire, become teachers. Mm. So it's like this attitude of fighting, for example, and never giving up. Well, at some point I have to switch that. So now I got to switch that to teaching others. 
Otherwise, I'm going to kill myself. That's kind of that's kind of how I try to frame business development for coaches. Is a lot of coaches struggle when they have to become the CEO of their business. Mm -hmm. They they feel this imposter syndrome of I'm not the one doing all of the coaching, therefore mm -hmm. I'm not as important. And I'm like, no, no, you're actually coaching just at a different level. You're coaching your staff. You're coaching your employees. Sometimes you're, you're coaching yourself to get through the rigors of all of the shit. But you're still yeah. a coach, right? So teaching is still a, a function of what they were doing at a lower level. Yeah. It's just extending really the value and the reach and the impact of their organization. Yeah. It's just unfortunate because we don't um, we don't celebrate those guys and girls, right? We don't celebrate the UFC fighter who did two years at the pro level, then retired and then became a no. coach and loved life, had a family and kids and like mm -hmm. had a great healthy life no. because he made his, he made well, it, he got his bag. It. Then he got into a, a job that fulfilled him longevity wise. Nobody talks about him. No. You want to talk about the extremes, like the Ferguson's that have gone in the ring like a dog and just war Remember after Chuck war Liddell? after war. Yeah. Chuck Liddell's a great example. And that dude's that. probably fought. And I mean, shout out to Chuck. I mean, I mean he's a warrior, wars. but he went too far. Yeah, he's got to be fucked. But I mean, yeah. I mean, how, how hard that is for them too, because they. Um, well, I'll give, I'll give you guys a name, like if because you guys are casual UFC fans. Do you know who James Krause is? Mm -hmm. You do. Yeah. Okay. So I'm most people, if I said James Krause, you're like, who's that? Yeah. Well, I'm more of a UFC fan than these guys. Right. So. so it's like, so why why do we not know James Krause? Well, James is an amazing fighter. He won a lot of fights in the UFC. He's now a coach yeah. to a lot. Like he runs a camp that I believe is one of the best camps yeah. in UFC, but he's also transitioned now. He's doing a podcast. He's getting his media out That's there. That's what I mean. And nobody, nobody is celebrating somebody. Nobody cares. Yeah, nobody cares. Which is so sad. Because he's not an extreme. Because yeah. he didn't make it to Chuck Liddell type of status, Tony Ferguson well, type status. he didn't get status. his face beaten in in his last fight. And yeah, people for like, a oh, poor, poor James Krause for, you know, overextending. Well, yeah. it's hard because it requires a tremendous, um, self-awareness and personal mm -hmm. growth. Because if you achieve, if people don't realize this, a lot of people don't understand this, that if you achieve a great deal of notoriety and success being and acting a particular way, that's probably one of the hardest places to be when you need to change. Because it's who I am, people love me, I'm crushing at it. And how do you abandon that when it's time mm -hmm. to abandon it? You know, you got all this love for it and you got all the success. Now I got to change gears. Well, your, like identi your identity is completely wrapped up. And it's it. an identity you love, yeah. right? It gave you all this great stuff. It's like, no well, wonder people have to literally get, you know, hurt in order for them to see it. I'll give you a great one right now in the journey I'm on. For the better part of 18, 19 years, my my goal in the gym was either performance or muscle gain, right? To some degree, it was always performance. I wanted to get bigger. I wanted to get stronger. I, right. I wanted to look better. I'm in a position now where there's no professional golfer that is, you know, 5'10", 200 pounds, right? <laughs> and and so I've begun this journey of actively losing muscle. And so- Boy, how hard is that? It is the it? hardest fucking thing I've ever <laughs> yeah, done in my entire right? life. Yeah. Because I wake up in the morning, I, don't even, I won't even get on the scale, but I'll look in the mirror and I'm like, I'm a skinny bitch. Skinny bitch. <laughs> and, and so I go around all these golfers and they're like, oh, you're jacked. And then I see myself on video and I'm like, fuck, I've lost so much muscle. And I, and I have to like, you know, I have such a self identity tied to the 19 years of pursuing gaining muscle. And so my identity was that I'm this guy that can, you know, walk the walk yeah. of my talk. And I was like, yeah, I talk about gaining muscle. I talk about getting lean and look, I can do it over and over again. And so now I'm doing this and I, I'm not going to lie, man, I have this massive fear of getting on stage at coaching con next year and grabbing the mic and having a thousand people in the stands looking at me and being like, is, does he have cancer? Wow. Like, like yeah. I, I actually fear that people are going to judge me. Well, being around all the golfers is probably a good thing because it, they- Oh, that's a great ego boost. Right, no, I'm saying, it's, it's, <laughs> I mean, when you think about it, it's probably a, a good place for you to pursue while you're trying to overcome those, you know, deep-rooted insecurities. But I, because I think that so many of our, I think logically we could all sit here and build a plan for me to lose muscle and still be healthy and functionally sure. fit, right? Yeah. The execution of that's going to be insanely difficult. Of course. Well, and, and mainly because of the psychological part, not because it. of the lack of knowledge or discipline. Exactly. Yeah. And no, I think because you got that, tons of knowledge and discipline. Right. I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't have achieved all the things I've achieved if I didn't, but it's it's still really hard. And I think that that speaks, and this would be a whole other podcast, which is, you know, why when every resource is out there, are people not achieving results? And, you know, I say this, you know, going back to our certification, I say this the very first thing. Nothing you're going to learn from me on day one is not something you couldn't find on Google. And so my question is, as an aspiring coach, why don't you know it? And the reality is there's too much of it out there. You're not disciplined enough to synthesize it and figure out what you should know. But most importantly, even if you do fucking know it, 
The reason you're struggling is because you're not using the principles that we've been discussing today. You don't understand how do you bridge the knowledge and how do you facilitate application? Right. And the best in the world are the ones that can create the application. I believe if somebody was to coach me on my journey right now, it would not be about the science of me losing no. muscle. I understand no. how to do no, it. No. They would be able to get my mind in a place That's where, and, and they would gamify it, they would do something to where I was okay with mm -hmm. continuing to lose muscle and that mentally I was able to perform at the same level as I could. This is the this is the argument that we get into with other coaches and because this is true for everyone, by the way, and PhDs Absolutely. Not just you. and that are in our space because everybody wants to debate the science. And it's like you're to, in in our opinion, like you are missing the most important piece, which is the psychological and behavioral Bingo. piece. If because yeah, okay, so what? In a controlled environment, this study says this. Like, We're not lab rats. None of that matters if I can't get my client, which I've trained hundreds of them, thousands between all three of us, that I've tried to get to do X, Y, and Z that the study says. Yep. If ninety percent of them fail me, that study is fucking moot. Yeah, doesn't even matter. Well, so to, why to am live, I arguing with you? To over live forever, that? we should go low carb, right? Like yeah. we understand that. We should also stop training, and we should, you know, again, sleep in a cave and take long walks on the beach. Yeah. I'm not going to stop training. I'm also not going to give up carbs. Like, period. The end. Yeah. And so if you can't help me inside of the application where maybe I train less frequently, maybe I train less intensely, maybe I enjoy my training at lower intensities, maybe we manipulate my carb intake to where I can still do the things I want, then you're a shitty coach. Because spouting off facts to me that I fundamentally just don't want. Yeah. Great. Like, that's, I understand you're smart. And there's so many fucking academics in this world. That's true for everybody. I'll never forget this. As, a, as an early trainer, I think it must have been year two or three, I had a client that hired me was severely obese. And I used to run a gym that was across the street from a hospital. They, they worked at the same one later on. But they had a, ga a gastric bypass program there. And at some point, we would get some of their patients. So this guy came to me, big guy. Was, he had to lose weight in order to get the surgery. Mm. Okay. Anyway, we got in these deep conversations. And at this point, I really started to figure out that being vulnerable and honest was a great way to get people to do the same thing back. So we're talking and, and he says, you know, he goes, uh, I'm actually a little, I'm really nervous about losing a lot of weight. And I said, why? And he says, because, uh, I, I, I don't, I don't want people to approach me. I don't want to, I don't want to have these kind of relationships where I get close with people. I say, what? And he goes, yeah, he goes, I'm really realizing that a lot of what I did, this was him personally. A lot of what I've done to myself was really to create this kind of barrier mm. between me and deep relationships. And it, it had to go back to his childhood yeah, yeah. and stuff like that. But when I heard that, it's like, okay, you give him all the X's and O's, you give him the ones and zeros. It ain't, it doesn't matter. No, that matters. And back to Adam's point, you, you could show me a study that says that swimming in a cold lake burns 15% more body fat than uh, doing cardio in the afternoon. If my client's like, I ain't going to go swim in a cold lake in the morning, it doesn't matter. Yep. None of that matters. It's all about the behaviors. It's all about the behaviors. And that's why we need to talk about this. And that's why, and, and again, <coughs> what I try to do is I try to sell people on how to do the right stuff by talking to these behaviors. For example, I think it's it's wise for everybody to cycle through seasons of performance, getting leaner, and longevity. Yep. How do I communicate that to someone who just wants to get leaner? Or how do I communicate to someone who just wants Bingo. to perform better? Well, here's how. If you don't cycle in and out of that, you're going to lose your whatever you're, you're seeking. So like for you, for example, who's always wanting to be lean, you know at some point, you even talked about it, you'll do enough of the other stuff yep. to get you out of the hole, yep. right? So you've understood that at least, right? So that's how I try to communicate it. And I think that there's a big, I think this the space is missing that tremendously because we always argue over the mechanistic aspects. Well, I mean, I think Jason hit it earlier. It's we, it's the marketing piece, right? It's, so it's, yeah. it's, it, we're, it's much easier for us to divide you, cattle you here and there, and then market directly to this one specific goal, that one pain point. Oh, you want to be ripped? I'm going to market yeah. everything. There. I'm not going to tell you it's a triangle. And if you go this way a little bit, you're going to pull yeah, from that. That's way. a conversation. Yeah, that's, and that's, that's complicated. Sexy it's sell, not though. sexy. It means long time. It means that you don't get exactly what you want. It's much easier for me to be like, what you want to get ripped? Okay. Here's what I have for you. Here's the supplement. Here's the way we train. Here's the way we think like, and sell you that. And you're more likely to convert that person to, to revenue much you, quicker you, and easier. I, it's not, I asked a question one time, on my social media, and I think it was in December. And I said, um, you know, if, if next year, all of your marketing had to speak truth, would your marketing change? Mm. And like crickets. 
<laughs> because people are like, fuck, I would actually Ooh. have to start telling the truth because wow. everybody's, uh, everyone in our space is promoting they have a fat loss solution. Yeah. And not saying you don't, but we all know as coaches, 90% of people that come to us, right, especially in today, right, 2022, yeah. they're metabolically compromised to some degree, just yeah. relative to the protocols that have been thrown out in like the last 10 years. It's not the fault of the consumer, like the education, you know, circa 2000 really 2007 2010 was so poor mm -hmm. right it was it was paleo in high performance environments it was low carb in high performance environments it was excessive calorie deficits and and i think that the prevailing knowledge now is that you don't need excessively low calories to lose body fat you just need to sustain a, a smaller calorie deficit for a longer period of time and you'll do so in a healthy manner the problem is we're, we're battling the the you know all the poor protocols from the last generation and nobody wants to market hey i'll help you lose fat but we'll begin our fat loss journey in six months after yeah. we recover from all the shit because that's not sexy you know no. even on the business side i i've been having this like epiphany in my head which is every business coach under the sun is like i you know i'll make you a hundred thousand dollars and I'm massively confident in my abilities to help any business. We've we've done it. We've built, you know, 10 plus millionaires at this point, thousands of six figure earners. It's great. But the the truth, if I was to take all of the marketing in the world, is I'm gonna make you your money back as fast as possible so that I feel like we're both on the same foundational level. And then I'm going to have you pump the brakes for a few months on only focusing on revenue because that's the biggest problem in the marketplace, by the way. I'm gonna help you build a foundation that will always allow you to build revenue. So are you cool with like making back 30 grand really quickly? Are you cool with then pausing for six months and then we can resume revenue? Yeah. Most coaches are like, well, no, the dickhead down the street is telling me I'm going to yeah. make 30 grand a month right away. So fuck you. Yeah. Except I'm looking out for you long term. They're looking out for your dollars in their pockets. Yeah. Please today. lie to me. And that's what people are out are yeah. actively seeking. You know, I got a speculation and then I want to uh, and then I'll transition to something I think is uh, interesting and I'd love your input. But the, the speculation is because I think that the Internet and media at first flooded the market with a lot more bad information. But mm -hmm. then what it did is it opened up the bandwidth to where before you had only so many channels and because there were only so many channels competing for all these people that, you know, doing a two or three hour discussion podcast was like, no, right. everything's 10 minutes or less. Um, it's all sound bites. There's no way you can communicate what we try to communicate because what we're trying to do is tell you the right way to do it right. in a five minute sound bite. It just doesn't work. It's a long form communication. And, and so I think the speculation is, I think it's going to go in the other direction because uh, the internet's limitless with with bandwidth. So now we can have two or three hour podcasts or I can do a thousand, like we've done over 1800 episodes where you could find probably a hundred fat loss episodes where we yep. talk about the same stuff, but we say it differently, a hundred different ways. And as you continue to listen, it'll start to make sense. Yeah. It's a conversation. That's so there's, there's repetition. Yes. So there's that. And then the second thing, this is what I love your speculation on. Uh, we've said for a long time that fitness, the pursuit of fitness is one of the most unassuming yet powerful forms or vehicles for personal growth. Okay. I would agree. People don't realize it when they go into it. They're like, I want to look better. I want to get fit. But it, but if you pursue it long enough, you got to learn acceptance because at some point you get older. So you're going to, you're not going to be as awesome or whatever as you were before. At some point you have to visit things that you weren't visiting before. Like at some point I had to like make peace with the fact that mobility is going to be a part of my routine. Yep. That's something I hated, but it's like, well, now I have to, and I want to keep doing this. So I'm going to make this a part of my life. Yep. At some point you have to figure out how to modify it because your lifestyle changes, stress, family, illness, whatever. So you, so it's it, through the journey of fitness, you have to process a lot and grow quite a bit. Have you experienced this through the, through the journey? Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I don't think I would be anywhere that I am today. And this is going to sound like a really crazy statement. Had I not become anorexic mm. and Prior to anorexia, I had no discipline. Um, I was the kid that had, I was super intelligent, but I had zero work ethic. And so like I got, you know, my SATs were very high. Like back when the scale was like 1600, I was like around a 1500 SAT. But my homework average was like a zero. Hmm. And I always said in school, like tests tell you how smart you are. Homework says how hard you work. And had I gone back, I would have actually, you know, can I go back today? I would take pride in having 100% homework average because it's a reflection of how hard you work. And I'll take hard workers over knowledgeable people any day. We can teach you skills. We can't teach you intangibles. Mm. And it was the first time in my life that I had to become completely dedicated to something because the reason I was anorexic was I wanted to, I wanted a shredded six pack. 
and I was willing to do anything to get there. I was so fucking miserable in that time of my life that I would sit on the floor of my parents, you know, of my room in my parents' bedroom and I would contemplate suicide at night. Like mm -hmm. that's how miserable I was. And I would wake up the next morning and I'm like, all right, let's go. And I, I would do anything. I mean, dietarily, like I would sit in front of people eating desserts and everything. And I'm like, nope, I'm strong. And you know, if you know anything about eating disorders, you start to hold it as a trophy. You start sure. to like, you know, look down on other people. And like, yeah, like that was a part of my life at the time too. But um, yeah, man, I, I don't think I would have the traits that I have today. Um, but you wouldn't have survived it either without the fitness pursuit. No, I, I wouldn't. And I think that, you know, some of the, I don't think I would be as, as strong willed today, right? Because I mean, we talked about my situation earlier, just the insane amounts of stress, mm. trying to juggle that with, you know, life and physical pursuits and having a daughter and you know, I lost my father this year. And I, I don't think I'd be able to power through a lot of the things that I did had I not gone through that either. And so I think that the, the results of my fitness have certainly made me physically strong enough to take on most things. But I think that the mental side and the mental uh, issues I've had to go through have also made me resilient enough to to go through a lot of things. I mean, a lot of people could tell you, you know, this time last year, I mean, you're, you guys are familiar. You know, we had trauma inside of our business, right? Yeah. Like, um, you know, had somebody kind of, you know, somebody I'd really trusted kind of just departed. And, um, you know, I had, uh, I lost my dad this year. I lost my co-founder in the last year. Um, you know, we've had, uh, we've had unlimited things happen and I've been resilient enough to just kind of put my head down and plow forward. And I don't think I would be anywhere here without, without fitness as mm. being really the, the cornerstone of my life. Do you, do you looking forward, do you see, uh, other things for you that you're going to probably have to tackle? I guess you mentioned oh, yeah. your gut. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, physically for sure. I, you know, I, I'm getting my, I finally went to an ortho last Thursday and had my hip looked at. And so I'm either going to have to have it scoped or have a full replacement. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. So I, I go for an MRI next week and we'll confirm which one. Um, I'm guessing I'm going to have a full replacement. What's it going to take for you to be super longevity focused or is that impossible? I don't know. I mean, if you ask me today, gun to the head, I, I don't see it happening. Yeah. But, you know, I... You're so great. I, I, I don't, I don't put it past you. I think you. I think you would if you had to. Yeah, I think there will come a time where I understand that. You know, I ironically, I... I'm really getting, I'm trying to start loving to read more. And so I've been reading the almanac of Naval and, you know, Naval states in there that physical health is his number one priority. And, you know, Naval is pretty successful. Mm. And so if Naval prioritizes physical health uh, above everything, above mental health, above, you know, business, um, you know, if, if really smart people have done it before me, maybe I should look more into it. But, you know, I, I think that I jokingly, you know, I'm self-deprecating and say how, how poor my longevity is. I, I think that I secretly probably do a lot of really good things. Like, well, in uh, comparison to the average person, you're yeah, light I get, years ahead of, I get seven to nine hours of sleep per night. Right? right. Like, I mean, I went to sleep last night here in San Fran at eight 30 last night. And I mean, time zones, et cetera. Right. You, but, you have, you have family, you have friends, you keep yourself at a moderately low body fat percentage, you strength train. I right. mean, you sleep. I mean, those are, I eat vegetables. You're every checking day. the box like on I, a lot of what most people yeah. Yeah. Are, are really missing out. You don't, you probably don't eat tons of processed food. I mean, there's a lot of things that you are doing in the direction of quote, unquote, also a very high standards. So I compare myself to probably perfection. And so when I'm self-deprecating enough to say that I don't do these things, it's comparison yeah. to like being a hundred out of a hundred. Sure, and I'm, sure. you know, I'm probably like an 85 out of a hundred. So certainly not bad. Um, you know, I, I think long-term man, it's, uh, I can't wait to see what, what unfolds. And I think that that's really the coolest part of where I'm at in life now is I've always been very entrenched in the now and I'm very focused. Like, don't get me wrong, I'm a very focused person, but I also understand there's way more to come. I think we had a very poignant conversation before this about things that are happening in life right now. And I, it, you know, had this happened, the opportunities I have on the table today, and they happened three years ago, I would have very much been about the now and I would have not seen the future. Whereas I think today my decisions or my actions are, are far more dictated by the future. And I think that's growth and evolution of me as a person. Yeah. So, okay. One more question. And uh, maybe this will put you on the spot a little bit, but um, why are the coaches at NCI so loyal to NCI? And it's, and don't tell me it's because of the money they make and how successful they are. I don't think I, it's I, any of it. Okay, good. Because yeah. <laughs> I, I've look, I've, I've run enough businesses. I've, I've been in enough gyms and had enough teams to know that that's not what creates crazy loyalty. So I Although have, my that helps. it helps. It helps. It does. <laughs> well, it does. I think that, that's a side effect, right? So my, I, I have it, my, it guesses. also can be, it also can become the biggest detriment. You're because right. It can also mm -hmm. facilitate entitlement. That's right. So, yeah. so why is it? Because I noticed this about the coaches with you guys. I mean, yep. we, I, we're on weekly calls with your coaches and I talk to a lot of them. I get DMS from them and the loyalty to you guys um, is, uh, is exceptional. Yep. What is it? Yeah. You know, it's, it's interesting, man. I think that 
I've tried to become very introspective of this because it's something I'm very proud of, but it's not even to the level I want it to be yet. And I think that what remains to still be achieved is a reflection of me. And so all the, the personal growth that I need to do will grow the community. Um, that being said, the personal growth I've experienced and the, the personal growth that our team has experienced together is I think what yields the success of our community. Mm -hmm. And I say that in the sense of everything we've done from day one has been in the, you know, kind of in the presence of the connection based model. And so when you come to NCI, you learn that. And I, you know, kind of going back to the statement, I don't care how much you know about health and fitness. If you can't get your client to facilitate that, um, you know, via implementation, then really you're not a very good coach. And the only way you can do that is through connecting with them. Uh, sometimes that's storytelling to your clients. Sometimes that's vulnerability with your clients. Sometimes that's being stern and yelling at your clients. Right? Everybody's different. Everybody is wound differently. I feel like you got to be a little bit of a chameleon. And I know we've talked about that when yeah. I've been in here previously. Um, but I, I think it's the notion that I'm never going to ask you to do something that I haven't done or that I wouldn't do myself. Uh, I'm always going to give you a reason for why I'm telling you to do something. I'm never going to make you do anything and I'm going to support you above everything else, not your results, not you know the way you feel, nothing else. I'm going to support you and your journey. And because I'm willing to do that, my team has adopted that mindset and because they are willing to, they are actively touching the community in such a way. Um, but you know, I, this is done across the board. This isn't just in personal communication. This is also in our marketing. Um, when, when we look at as a company, how we've grown, uh, one of our biggest weaknesses is we have no direct response marketing, meaning we don't run an ad and say, buy our shit. We get to know you. And then because people tend to like us or because we like you, or there's a good connection, holy shit, you end up buying from us. Imagine that it's like two people that like each other go on a date and then they, you know, turn into like an actual relationship. Mm -hmm. Um, we would rather do business and we would rather have a community of people that genuinely like each other than people that are willing to spend dollars. Uh, that's been the cornerstone of massive growth. Um, it's also what the coaches that have been successful with us use as their cornerstone of massive growth. And I think it's what's going to continue to allow us to ascend and, and help a lot of people, man. I think that somebody said to me the other day, I, I just did a, I did Kenny Santucci's event in New York um, three days ago. And like I sat on a panel and, and I did, you know, we answered all these questions and I came off stage and it was like a line of like 20 people that wanted to just come up and thank me for like the bluntness of my answers. And my VP of education looks at me and he's like, dude, like, look at that. He's like, look at that line of people. Like you just did that. You impacted that. And I don't think that we ever as coaches sit back and reflect enough. I think we're so worried about the journey. We're so worried about the information we put out. We're we're so worried about the growth of our company that we forget that, man, one person, one is greater than zero. And if we continue to touch one person every day, we're winning. Yeah. Can I tell you what the coaches tell me? Please. But when I ask them, yeah. they say, because uh, Jason is real and he, act, and he really cares. So uh, basically what you dope. said, but they say it pretty succinctly. succinctly. So, yeah. That's dope, man. I mean, I, it's, it's cool to hear that. And it's still mm -hmm. humbling to hear. You know, mm -hmm. it's not to like get nostalgic on you, man. I remember the first time I, I came into this room, into this podcast room and I was just a coach, right? Like NCI was just was almost just beginning, man. And uh, I remember just being so in awe of the industry and to, to now, you know, we had an independent research done to now be one of the actual top certifications in the world. It's like, and think about the number of lives we've changed. It's, it's pretty crazy, man. It's awesome. It's, it's been dope. a great journey, man. It's always great to have that. you on the show. Mm -hmm. Thank you, brother. Thanks. This one's really important, and that is to phase your training. If somebody trains for a full year doing a bench press, and they're always aiming for five reps, if you compared that person to a person who did bench press where they did three or four weeks of five reps, but then they did three or four weeks of 12 reps, and then three or four weeks of, let's say, 15 to 20 reps, and then they'll throw in some supersets, at the end of that year, you're going to see more consistent progress from the person who's moving in and out, and less injury.